I look forward to uh, reading the report, the upcoming report. My name is Manon Ras, and I, I'm here on behalf of the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment, which is an international network of people, volunteers, who share the conviction that cancer treatment and care should be available everywhere for everyone, regardless of gender, age, nationality, or financial resources. Our webpage is at cancerunion.org. As I said, we're a volunteer organization of people affected by cancer, their family members and friends, people who take care of people with cancer, healthcare professionals, doctors, cancer researchers, all of us committed to increasing access to effective treatment and care. I myself am a stage four HER2 positive breast cancer patient in active treatment since May 2010 and I feel very uh, fortunate to have uh, access to the most advanced cancer treatment available. <coughs> Thanks to successful and efficient treatment, my cancer, as for many cancer patients today, has become a chronic disease. It is costly and will be more and more costly for all of us as the price of insurance will increase to keep up with the many cancer patients living for longer and longer time. Had you act? We believe that cancer medicine and other essential medical tools, such as diagnostic tests, should be affordable. They are not, and it is getting worse. Like many patients, caregivers, doctors, insurers, and policymakers, I hope, were extremely concerned about the rapidly escalating cost of cancer medication. For example, according to one large private payer of healthcare, the average per cycle cost of cancer drug in 2014 was almost $18,650. The least expensive 2014 cancer drug is $7,400 every four weeks. And of course, the most expensive is $89,000 every six weeks. Appendix A of my testimony that I hope you can see right now is a table and a chart based upon data and cancer drug prices compiled by Dr. Peter Bach, based, based upon a methodology he developed earlier for an article on cancer drug pricing in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that he recently updated. Dr. Bach calculates the monthly cost of new cancer drugs at the time of the introduction of the medicine. We added a calculation of the monthly price as a percentage of the average monthly per capita income as measured by the gross national income reported by the World Bank. As you can see from the table and the graph, the initial price for cancer drugs have increased sharply, not only in nominal inflation adjusted terms, but as a percent of average of per capita incomes. Dr. Bach's data includes 101 cancer drugs put on the market from 65 to 2008, and of these, just eight had monthly prices more than average monthly incomes. However, of the new 40 cancer drugs placed on the market from 2009 to 2014, all of them, all 40, had monthly prices higher than average monthly incomes. But it is even worse. 26 of these drugs had monthly prices that were more than twice the average monthly incomes. The median price as a percentage of income was 27% for the drugs put on the market from 1965 to 1999, 127% for the drugs put on the market from 2000 to 2008, and 231% for the cancer drugs approved from 2009 to 2014. This trend should worry everyone since everyone is paying the taxes and private insurance premiums. Managers or private uh, government insurance program often respond to high prices by narrowing the allowed use of the expensive medicine and requiring high patient co-payments. But rationing is not an acceptable, acceptable solution to me and to the many person living with cancer who would benefit from new drugs, including those with excessive prices. I do not have a choice. 
If patients lack access to government or private insurance, one response is to go without, a heartbreaking response for those affected by cancer. Going without should be seen for what it is, a form of rationing by ability to pay. In this regard, you act as two messages for those shaping trade policy. First, protect the right of governments to take measures to curb expensive prices for drugs. This includes the measures necessary to facilitate the competitive supply of affordable biologic drugs and includes addressing and overcoming, when necessary, the barriers to competition, such as patents, monopolies on taste data, and providing access to manufacturing know-how. In our opinion, when the prices are excessive, it is important to put the monopoly at risk and not the patient. And trade agreements need to recognize the importance of exception to intellectual property rights. You have to change some of the focus from IPR to innovation. There has been a failure in all the trade agreements to address the most important issue regarding innovation, and that is the funding of research and development. High drug prices have an impact on R&D spending, but only to induce a minor fraction of drug revenues into R&D. Remember, when a pharmaceutical company spends 15% of revenue on R&D, they spend 85% on things that have nothing to do with R&D. So high prices is an expensive and harmful way to, introduce, to induce R&D spending. What all the trade agreements lack are measures to induce more R&D spending through other mechanisms such as the linkage from drug prices. As you know, uh, in 2014, nine of 10 cancer drugs qualified for the Offering Drugs Tax, tax Credit, a 50% subsidy for R&D that only US taxpayers subsidize. The NIH spends more than 30 billion on research, much of it related to new drug development. What trade agreements lack are effective mechanism, or indeed any mechanism, to expand public sector funding of R&D or share the cost of subsidies like the offered drug uh, tax credit. By choosing to focus on intellectual property rights instead of research and development of new drugs, and by effectively promoting high prices instead of innovation in health, trade policymakers are elevating drug company interests over the public, including patients, taxpayers, and employers. As another member of UAP wrote to me just this morning, some people may pay with their lives for this policy. Thank you. <laughs>